Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's artist talk featuring the artists from the Richmond Art Gallery's current Codes of Silence exhibition, uh, Alisa Cohen and Carolina Monet, and the exhibition curator Zoe Chan. My name is Kathy Tycholis. I'm the Richmond Art Gallery's Education and Public Programs Coordinator. And on behalf of the Richmond Art Gallery Association, I would like to welcome you to this program that takes place from the Richmond Art Gallery that is on the ancestral territories of the Hunkamedum speaking peoples, uh, which are the nations that lived along the Fraser River Delta, including the Musqueam. Um, we are very appreciative to be able to live and work on these lands, and we welcome all of you from wherever you are joining us tonight. Um, in a few moments, I will welcome our guests for a short presentation of each of their works in our exhibition, um, as well as from the curator uh, Zoe Chan, uh, followed by a Q&A session with all of our panelists um, and with you, our online audience. I would like to introduce our guest artists first. I, I will just read you their uh, short bios just as a means to kind of get to know them a little bit before they present the work that is in our exhibition. Um, and then Zoe will introduce the exhibition a bit. So first we have Elisa Cohen. Elisa's work has been exhibited in festivals and galleries internationally with solo exhibitions at Gallery 44 Center for Contemporary Photography in Toronto, Gallery Suvi Latien in Berlin, Glasmug Gallery in Cologne, and Reykjavik Photography Museum in Iceland. They hold a Master's of Visual Studies from the University of Toronto and completed a fellowship at the Kunsthoch School for Medien in Cologne under German experimental filmmaker Matthias Müller. Cohen has participated in artist residencies in Canada, Denmark, and the Netherlands, and has won grants and prizes in Canada and Europe. Their work is part of the permanent collection of Oakville Galleries and numerous private collections. So welcome to Elisa. Next up is Carolyn. Carolyn Monet is an Ashinabi French multidisciplinary artist from Outaouais, Quebec. She studies sociology and communication at the University of Ottawa and the University of Granada in Spain before pursuing a career in the visual arts and film. Her work has been programmed internationally at the Whitney Biennial in New York City, the Toronto Biennale of Art, KOS Museum in Copenhagen, Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, and the National Art Gallery in Ottawa. Solo exhibitions include Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, Schoen Kunsthelf in Frankfurt, Arsenal Contemporary in New York City, and Centre d'Art International de Vassivière in France. And her films have been programmed at film festivals such as at TIFF, Sundance, Aesthetica, Palm Springs, and Cannes. In 2016, she was selected for the Cine Fondation Residency in Paris. Her work is included in numerous collections in North America, as well as the permanent UNESCO collection in Paris. Monet is a recipient of the 2020 Pierre Ayo Award, the 2020 Sobi Art Award, the Maratha Mita Fellowship, and the Reveal Indigenous Art Awards. She is based in Montreal and represented by Bluen Division Gallery. So welcome, Caroline. Welcome to both of the artists. Um, I will let Zoe introduce the Codes of Silence uh, exhibition first, and then each artist will talk a little bit about their specific artworks in the exhibition. Uh, and then we will open up the floor to all of your questions. Um, I'll be in the background um, helping to monitor your questions and comments. So for now, Zoe, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. And I'm so, I'm so pleased to be with um, the artists here and, and just so honored and excited um, um, to be here with you. So if Kathy is um, at the gallery, I'm actually zooming in from Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I'm very grateful to be able to live and work here. And yes, again, I want to just thank the artists for joining us today. I'm just so excited to hear you speak and also just to have a, the chance to ask you questions about the works I've been living with at, um, at the gallery. Um, yeah, and also just to also to meet Caroline for the first time. It's not the first time we've worked together, but um, uh, it's the first time that we're meeting, albeit online. So welcome, welcome to both of the artists and welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Um, so codes of silence, um, I'll just maybe share, share um, a screen here. Um, codes of silence is a group exhibition featuring four videos respectively by guest artists, um, Shirley Bruno, 
Elisa Cohen, Caroline Monet, and, and Colleen Smith in conjunction with paintings by Tony Only, Leslie Poole, and Harry Sandbridge. And those are all paintings from the Richmond Art Gallery's permanent collection. So I really liked um, this image just because I managed to pack all of the videos <laughs> into, or at least fragments of the videos into one image. Um, so we have Shirley Bruno's um, projection on the right. You can just see a bit of um, Caroline Monet's uh, projection in the middle of the gallery. Uh, we see um, at the far end, um, Elisa Cohen's video, Kathy, and the stack of posters on the, the plinth nearby. And on the left, um, you're greeted first by Col uh, Colleen Smith's uh, video. Um, so I just wanted to say uh, just a few words about the research that inspired this exhibition. Um, it, I had um, previously uh, looked at artists making hybrid documentaries in collaboration with their subjects and which focused on the importance of the voice. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> so uh, research that had focused on the voice um, uh, in defining individual and collective identity. So these video projects often integrated interviews, oral storytelling, show and tell sessions, or, or songs. However, I became equally fascinated by those moments where there was silence, yet something was still being communicated nonetheless. I was also deeply inspired by Kevin Quashie's notion of quiet, as outlined in his book, The Sovereignty of Quiet. He argues in this book that in the face of oppression, violence, and erasure, that African-American communities have necessarily prioritized um, an outward public facing um, expression, one that focused on being heard and in opposition or in resistance to the systemic racism of white supremacist culture. So this has been at the detriment, he argues, of a more internal, interior facing intimate modes of expression and being. And he reminds us of the importance of quiet which he uses metaphorically to mean the full range of one's humanity and interior life. So basically quiet for Kwashi is all the emotions of, of humanity, fear, vulnerability, joy. He also says that this interior life offers a kind of freedom and even a kind of protection from the outside world, a kind of fortification before going out into the world. So I thought his notion of quiet a fascinating one. And I wanted to foreground videos that were focusing on interiority, intimacy, in, and quiet in a wide range of ways. Um, so there's another um, image of the exhibition. Um, but I wanted to say, I'll just say a few words about um, the two videos that unfortunately the artists weren't able to join us today. Um, but the first video is uh, Colleen Smith's Black and Blue Over You after Banya. Bas Yan Adar for Ishan. So the artist has explained that this video was made in response to the death of a friend's nephew called Ishan. And in the video, we see the artist in loop sequences making bouquets of blue, black, and white hydrangeas, lilies, and lilacs, chosen for their closeness to the colors of, of bruising. And the making of bouquets is an act of mourning for this young black man. And this private act of grief is shown as being just as important as public activism. And I should mention that this video, there's no, um, the only sound is a soundtrack of, of uh, a saxophone, um, saxophone improvisations. Um, another video um, is Shirley Bruno's video, Tizen. So this is a short film, about half an hour. It reworks a popular Haitian folk tale that is still told today. And depending on the storyteller, emphasizes different themes. Uh, for Tizen, um, Shirley uh, really teases out the coming of age aspect of the story. And I love the magic and mystery um, that she brings to her rendition of this, of this tale. And what I think is particularly remarkable about the film is the performance of the actor playing the main role. And actually she worked with all non-actors, a, a family in fact. Um, we, see, um, we see this young woman that you can see in the image here, often in a state of reflection and repose. 
And it's just fascinating to be up close with her and, and just, you know, kind of imagine what's going on in her mind. And I couldn't help thinking how rare it is to see a young Black actor who is not playing the sassy sidekick. Um, uh, here they are the, or, you know, or the hilarious best friend. Um, here they are the, the main character and we are asked to identify with them in a, in a kind of universal kind of way, despite the story being very grounded within a very specific um, geographical and cultural context. Um, so those are, I just wanted to mention those two videos as also the two they're perhaps most closely linked to um, Kwashi's idea of quiet. But I have very eclectic taste in video, and I wanted to, to show just a range of what that could mean in different videos. So I won't talk to I won't talk about the other videos um, just because the artists are here, and I'm sure it's more interesting to hear them talk about the videos. So I'm going to stop screen sharing here, and Kathy's going to share her screen, and we're going to um, pass it over to Elisa. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's exciting to to have the opportunity to talk about this work with you with you all, and I'm interested to hear, yeah, to answer questions or talk about it further afterwards. Um, so this, so typically, I mean, in my practice um, throughout throughout, uh, whether it be a video sculpture or um, in some cases, painting and dance work. Um, I work in in what what I what I understand to be a found footage film tradition, and so um, in in line with that, this work is um, sourced entirely from Kathy Bates's film and television appearances in from 1980 to to 2019 to to the to the year that I was working in. Um, and the way that the structure of the video, the looping video works, it's around eight minutes long, is that it, it basically what I've done is taken um, pieces of these performances, small gestures, um, lines of dialogue, et cetera, where Kathy Bates appears um, in the frame on her own, whether I've cropped her to be alone or she, she originally appeared that way to create what I've come to call a, a composite character. And a composite character in my work is um, basically the function of a single identity that is built from, from hundreds of other identities. Um, and so in this case, it's really Kathy as herself built from herself, hundreds of herself. Um, if you go to the next image, you can see it a little bit brighter. And so here we see um, another clip of Kathy. And you, so you have this sense of her as many of you may, may have seen it, but um, you have this sense of her sort of in a way that that she doesn't, um, we, we have the famili familiarity of many of these films. We, uh, many people relate to, to her or recognize her from Misery, for example. Um, I think that was a, in the early eighties. Yeah, a horror film from the early eighties, if you're not familiar. And, um, but, you know, what was important here was to, and, and I'll do this in all of my work where I take out all of the diegetic sound. So the sound that originated in the um, source material and replace it um, with new sound and whether that be effects or music, et cetera. And um, I had the great um, privilege and excitement <laughs> of working with Barry Dupay on this one, actually the soundtrack for this. So a Vancouver artist who, whose work I really admire. And so it is, you know, it's, it was so exciting to see it curated in a show about silence because so much of what we hear from this work are her, are Kathy's sort of embodied noises. So sighing, um, you know, a, a grunting as she stands up, a kind of release, a laugh, a cackle, all these different kinds of noises that we make when um, we don't necessarily have words or when words um, aren't enough, for example. So um, yeah, if we accompanying the video and you can look, we can go to the next slide, is a poster and the poster itself is sort of mimics say the size of a movie poster. So imagine, you know, this being the, the poster that announces the film. 
And so it's roughly 24 by 40 inches. It's a takeaway poster. So when you go to the gallery, you can, you can have, you can take one for yourself. Um, and this is a, another, another version of, of this methodology that I've developed over the years, uh, a composite. So here we see uh, many, many pieces of Kathy Bates's face combined to create a new kind of version of her, a new, a new image of her. And if you go to the next image, on the back of the poster is the mirror image of that composite with the list of the source material um, and the descriptions of the role Kathy played in the source material that was sampled in this piece um, with, yeah, with the descriptions of uh, the IMDB descriptions of those roles. So for example, you know, in the piece itself, you might see her, you see her at one point in a hot tub and she's laughing and um, talking about uh, the lobster induced diarrhea that she might have in a few minutes and she's drinking scotch. Um, but if you go back to the source of have two clips that that came from, she's in, instead of this sort of lighthearted, fun moment, she's instead um, in the original source material called, yeah, re referred to as, um, let me find it. Um, mother to a strange daughter, unskilled, tormented, broken soul, borderline maniacal. And so we can see already this sort of juxtaposition that's happening in, in just if we take the effective pieces of her performances into another context, so, sort of just a simpler context, really. Um, and then the heaviness of that history and the heaviness of those roles that she's played. And, and you know, we can talk a little bit about maybe later about, yeah, my interest in, in her as a character in, in and of itself. She is the first actor I've ever looked at um, in as, you know, in terms of an oeuvre of, of actors uh, work to work with. I've always worked with many, many, many actors in a single piece. Um, so Kathy Bates is the first time that I've I've looked at a single actor. Um, but it's sort of important, yeah, it's been important to have this uh, context and have this, you know, when we need to understand the truth or or the way something has been um, codified in Hollywood, we go to IMDb. And so just to have this sort of reference there has been um, a really nice uh, accompaniment to the video work. I can go to the next slide and you'll see, um, so in the, in, uh, the Richmond Art Gallery, this is how it, it looks exhibited. So the poster side by side, front and back. And then you saw in the um, image that Zoe shared that how, how it looks stacked on a plinth. So it's also available that way. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, there's lots, lots probably we could go into later, um, but yeah. It's 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 just making me think before I before we move on to Caroline um, and then open up the conversation between us. But I it, it reminds me too when you mentioned that um, working with found footage that is also something that Caroline has is familiar with working with the NFB archives, for example. Um, but yes, there's there's there are actually many interesting. Um, resonances between your practices that have surprised me that I'm looking forward to discussing with you both in in further detail but thanks for that um cool. mini introduction Elisa yeah um maybe we can move on to to Caroline's work uh with um yeah yes hello everyone quickly I'm also very happy to be participating in this conversation and getting to know especially Elisa's work um, so my work in this exhibition is titled Creatura Dada. It's a video piece that I made back in 2016. It's a commissioned work uh, from the Festival du Nouveau Cinéma in Montreal, which is kind of an avant-garde uh, new cinema type of film festival. And every year they commission five directors to create this three minute or four minute video piece. And um, it was very difficult for me at the time because I had just finished a, a film called uh, Mobilized, 
And somehow I wanted to have the same kind of energy found and mobilized, but but this one I had almost uh, the white page syndrome where I just really did not know what to what to make for this commission. And uh, in 2016, we were celebrating the 100 uh, years of Dadaism. And I've always been uh, intrigued how uh, we could appropriate the tropes and attitudes from European art history in order to create, um, you know, our own ways of, of looking at art history from our Indigenous perspective. For so long, we've been, you know, uh, denied the right to express ourselves. And I always imagine what would it look like if we had a chance to, you know, uh, explore Renaissance or Dadaism or Futurism uh, from a, a First Nation perspective. So I decided that I would give myself this rule and explore Dadaism from a from a First Nation perspective. And um, so with this, I invited a few women uh, at my table and made a feast for them, uh, where we drank a lot of champagne and had oysters and and very uh, gourmet uh, kind of luxurious meal. What is considered luxurious meal? But it's um, it's also a little hint because lobster oysters these are also our traditional foods, but today they're considered very luxurious and and uh, high end. Um, and these women they are uh, from the francophone indigenous community uh, in Quebec. Uh, for me, it's important to showcase these women because often, uh, you know, francophone indigenous people are, are double marginalized. Uh, they don't necessarily have access to everything that's happening in the anglophone community. So I want to show these women as, um, you know, being leaders in their community and show how proud they are, how resilient, how eccentric, beautiful, um, elegant they can be. And um, matriarchs and women play an important role in my practice. I always try to bring a very positive representation of Indigenous women on screen uh, because they're still today the most marginalized group in Canadian society. Uh, and these women, if, for those who don't know this woman in particular, this is Alane Sobomsa when she's kind of the queen of documentary filmmaking in Canada. She's uh, nowadays 90 years old and made over 52 feature films. Um, other women at my table were uh, Nadia Meyer, who's a prominent uh, uh, Anishinaabe visual artist. Uh, Swanej Bertrand, she's, uh, she's a costume designer, but also a chef uh, here in Montreal. My sister, Emily Monet, who's a, a performance artist and a, a festival director. Uh, Naka, who's an activist. So these women are very, you know, important and leaders. And Dadaism is about um, getting rid of all rules to reinvent uh, new rules. So I thought it was interesting to use Dadaism as a way to uh, gather these women to plot uh, the world around us, to reinvent the world around us and offer uh, new ways of seeing it. And, and a world where they would be present, they would be seen, they would be heard, uh, and they would be, you know, part of this, this society. So, um, yeah, this is uh, pretty much, I mean, there's uh, multiple layers into this film. Uh, I decided not to record the actual conversation. Uh, it's really rare that we have the opportunity to gather together and sit at the same table for multiple hours like this. Um, but I feel these conversations are, belong to us. Uh, I, instead, I decided to bring a soundtrack on top of these images, and the soundtrack uh, is created with sounds I recorded in my own kitchen, um, so uh, with salad bowls and glasses, and created this very kind of weird soundtrack with it um, that speaks to Dadaism that has no rules and, and uh, aiming at this freedom of liberty of creation and freedom of expression um, with a lot of exuberance. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I could say more about this, but I, I do think this is a, for me, this film in the end is really uh, geared towards emancipation and, and um, being, being really strong in our matriarchal values. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And um, it's, it's so great to hear you talk about this work. I hadn't thought about the of course, I did notice the 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 emphasis on food and just the enjoyment of food, but it it was it was very interesting to hear too about thinking about those foods, those luxury foods, um, as as 
as actually indigenous to the to the land. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was that was that was great. Um, uh, I well well thinking thinking about similarities between between both of your your work. One thing that you 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 did bring up a bit, Caroline, was um, the importance of the sound the sound design. I wonder if you could talk about that a bit more and about um, the importance. I don't know the, the importance of um, uh, of of listening and and the sound design and yeah that relationship for this work. Yeah, in, in all of my video work, uh, the sound is uh, makes up 50% of the actual experience. For me, it's really important that sound uh, is there to complement the image, and it it's not a it's not there to support the image. It's actually there to as a as a duo, as a it's working together to create uh, uh, emotions, to create a narrative, and. Uh, most of my work often they don't have too much dialogue. So it's really uh, it passes through the music and the emotion of sound design. Um, in this case, I'm I'm lucky to be surrounded with musicians and sound artists and my my friends uh, and my and my surroundings, so I can work with them. And often I'll just collect um, sounds and and kind of build something around it, and then I can give it to a mixer or someone that will help me make it a little bit more uh, pleasing for the ears. Um, in this case, it was important that we that we see people talking, but the, removing the actual conversation is uh, was a deliberate choice, uh, really because um, our knowledge is not to be taken for everyone. It's not it's not to be consumed uh, by other people. And I find that sound you can really play with these ideas. Uh, with sound, when you decide to use silences, when you decide to have a, a, a sound that can be um, very high pitched, so you have a physical reaction to it, or it's really low pitched, so, so it, 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 you, you feel it in your stomach rather. Um, so I love that sound can be a sensorial experience and it, it comes to bring um, emotion through the images as well. Yeah, there's a great tension between the celebratory atmosphere and then also the very sort of powerful, I sort of maybe kind of linked to that kind of a revolutionary sort of quite very strong soundtrack that it, at times is is pounding. Um, Alisa, maybe you could talk too about your process of of sound design. Um, I know I was I was fascinated um, when you spoke about um how you gathered how you gathered your clips and also the process of almost getting to know Kathy Bates's um <laughs> Kathy Bates in a sort of nonverbal kind of way. <laughs> yeah, I, I can really relate to to what you were saying, Caroline. Like I think that there's this, yeah, I would say 50% of, of if not more of what what feels like the work and what and expressing the feelings and ideas and sensations of the piece comes from sound. And um, for, for Kathy, it was really, you know, I, I decided early on, like I, I usually when I build out composite characters, I'll build out several and they have a conversation with one another and they'll be in different channels, so in different videos. Um, and in this case, it's just a single video. And I decided early on that she would be talking to me that any dialogue that we hear her say was just a conversation between herself and 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 myself and so so it became really important to me and and it's as though we were in an elevator together was sort of my my um sense of of it so so what do you hear you know when you're in proximity to somebody when you're that close maybe too close you know you're sitting someone you're sitting next to somebody on public transit and you're just a little too close or you're sitting next to somebody you know crowded at a table and you you didn't choose it but you're there and that was the sort of scene that I was setting up for myself to listen to her and to listen to all the sounds that were possible from her her moving body and uncomfortable um morphing from body to body because this was her you know what I was working with was also her body her her physical body from 1980 to, to 2019 so you know we're looking at 40 years of of a, of a changing body and the 
you know, within eight minutes and, and sometimes shifting from one to the next in two, two or three seconds. So, so yeah, it was, I think to me, it was really about how can I feel her better? And then um, what would allow us, what would allow us all inside that relationship, that relationship between her. And even if you don't know, she's speaking to me, she's speaking out. So, so then she's speaking to somebody um, at one point, she says, here's your new studio and she she brings a table to set it up and that table is like a um you know a, a tray for for eating on like you're when you're yeah you know, if you're sick in bed or whatever you're having breakfast in bed either way this sort of um idea of 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 labor being also you know hidden and unseen and um yeah it it sort of functions fun the sound functioned in many many ways and also allowed there to be um the other the other piece of the sound and the other important role that sound played in that piece was um I didn't because I was only working with Kathy Bates I couldn't connect some some scenes together so it was actually just audio so you see black these these black sections in the piece where we only hear what's going on so you you're just you're just there to imagine that she's moved from one room outside or she's moved and you hear that you hear her doing that but we don't see it so it really for me is this bridge to to create narrative and to continue narrative in ways that aren't necessarily possible visually but also mm -hmm. maybe um give us a break from from this like constant um yeah image heavy world that we're in hmm. I want to I want to talk more about narrative but first I just I wanted to uh when we were t speaking a little bit in preparation for this talk last week and you were you mentioned the categories of clips that you've been gathering and collecting and you know you said you know you had a category called size or I don't know <laughs> grunts or snorks or I, I can't remember exactly but I thought that was very interesting to sort of read somebody from that sort of almost non like a, a pre-verbal or very physical kind of way yeah yeah, I mean Kathy Bates, like she she typically plays secondary roles, and even when she's in a in a as a protagonist, she is not likable, and so she's literally there to make other people more likable, and so she's like literally opening doors for people, and so and in in needing to do that in the source material, those grunts and those sounds were really present, because it was she she herself could not. She had to be supporting, and in order to be supporting, mm. there wasn't this sort of like language. Um, yeah. Um, maybe we can talk a bit more about narrative, um, because um, I think both of you are interested in 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 sort of presenting different different narratives um, and narratives that um, aren't typically represented in the mainstream. Um, Caroline, maybe you can you can speak to that a bit a bit more. Well, I, I think for me it's really about bringing positive representation of indigenous people on screen and and breaking some of those stereotypes that we've seen uh, in media, whether it's uh, on the news or or in movies in the past. Um, often, especially Indigenous women, they're often presented as the victim and and uh, under poverty. And and for me, I really want to change that narrative by by uh, diffusing and putting out in the world images of women that are very, you know, uh, bringing them back to the level of royalty almost, where they would be super elegant and super eccentric and very free. Uh, to be whoever they want to be, and uh, I feel that's that's my way of changing the narrative uh, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. It also, at the same time, it felt that, that um, I think you found a good balance between um, changing a represent the representation for the sort of general public, but also creating a representation that was very specific and. Um, really, as you said, by, for example, not sharing the soundtrack of the recorded, uh, the recordings of the, of their conversations or not recording the conversations that it was really for, um, it was really for you and your friends and that network. 
Yeah, and I have to say that this piece, Creatio Radada, is part of an ongoing series where I started, Creatio Radada was the first of that series where I started exploring different artistic movements seen from a First Nation perspective and showcasing Indigenous women, uh, whether it's through photography or video moving images. Uh, and I've explored Renaissance and I've explored, um, you know, the... Uh, October crisis of Quebec, so the 70s, and I recently explored the, the movement of futurism, and now I'm I'm looking at the uh, crazy uh, 20s and the, you know, so I'm looking kind of uh, historical moments in time where we were basically uh, not, we were uh, not present or we were put aside from these uh, moments, but we were very much present and, and having our own struggles as, as First Nation women. So I want to bring this back into the narrative uh, where we, we at first did not exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting too, in relation to Dadaism, for example, which has, which did have a link with primitivism and had, you know, was very much interested in uh, looking towards indigenous or African cultures, for example, to create, you know, Dadaist work and that appropriation. And so there's a kind of flipping of that also too that I find interesting. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, Alisa too, I wonder if you could speak to that in terms of, of representation and how you see that and sort of shifting or creating new types of narrative. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you could maybe speak to that a bit. Yeah, I mean, in in my I mean, in in my work, I really actually am less interested in representation and 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 interpretation and more in just the material. Like, what is there and what is what is what are we watching over and over and again? What is getting inside of us that we we can't uh, we don't realize? You know, we don't realize we've started to mimic or we don't realize we've started to want to be like. Um, so I, I often think about like just push pushing against that gravitational pull of of what we already know mm. um, or the familiar. And so um, every narrative that I'm building is really about sort of tracking my own sens sensory understanding of whatever I'm, I'm making, whether it be my relationship to Kathy Bates or um, yes, a relationship between two composite characters that I've built completely unrelated to um, their source materials, you know, fully, Full up, a whole other theme, um, and and in doing that, really just doing this very close study of the phenomenology of these horizontal of a horizontal way of looking at kind of cinematic material as material, and so what is what is that texture? What is that color? Can that all? What happens if I flip it? What happens if if it all becomes sort of what disrupts the image? What doesn't disrupt the image? How can I sort of play with that in different ways for different reasons? Um, it's hard. It's it's hard. yeah. Specifically with Kathy, I would say it, what needed to I needed to ground it in something, which was really her her conversation with me, and that there was that that, that subjectivity was the only thing that that allowed for um, the the juxtaposition of what I was working within and the representation behind it so what she represents to you know to Hollywood or what she represents to mainstream media or what she represents to what she represents of herself even um you know in in uh on talk shows you know or in interviews um you know it's 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 all of that needed to feel for me all that needed space and that mm -hmm. all needed to have its own life and um you know the freedom I guess to create working with that I don't know, necessitates that kind of space or providing providing that that opportunity to have all of those realities exist at once. Did you ever think of using like those kind of like talk show, like talk show Kathy or? Um, I did. I try, I had lots of um, like interviews at first as source material, but she's um, she's so earnest and and almost like uh, it. You know, she she just really wants to, she really wants to be a good actor and she is and that and that there's not much there in terms of I didn't want to touch it like there was something kind of sacred about it in a way that you know I just wanted to respect her as a person mm -hmm. um given that I was paying so much attention to her career 
Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I didn't end up working with it. And I love, I love what's happened to her. I love the performances in context and the heaviness of that context. And really it was to me just as important to um, feel the context she's in and been put in and chosen to be in. We can think about that in, in all those ways um, more than her, you know, and I think that that, um, or equally to her, I should say, um, I think that that became way more, a way more interesting material to work with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I was, um, just, just listening to, to both of you speak. I'm also thinking that one thing that I find really strong about both of your works is that, um, there, there is a, a critique, there is a critique of the mainstream culture, but also, um, it doesn't just stay there. There's, you're proposing a different kind of narrative. Um, I think Elisa, I mean, this idea of like, almost like in conversation with you, Kathy, you almost feel like there's a frustration, I guess, in the, in, in, like you've almost teased out a frustrated K Kathy Bates. Uh, it's frustrated with the limitations that she's been placed in. Um, uh, and yeah, so yeah, it's, it's very, it's, mm -hmm. um, and also your work clearly shows like a deep understanding and knowledge of all of the um, tropes of Hollywood, for example, but a, also a refusal just to stay there. And mm -hmm. yeah, and somehow manages to bring that material beyond it, beyond that. Mm -hmm. I'm not expressing myself well, <laughs> but um, somehow managing to 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 go beyond the perhaps the the sort of toxicity of of the original of the original material. Um, I wanted to ask you. There's a question asking if uh, oh. Kathy Bates knows she's the subject of an art show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as I know, she doesn't. Um, <laughs> maybe now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think she does uh, or will. Yeah, I mean, we'll see where it, where it goes, but no. <laughs> no. I'd love to meet her. I mean, I think she lives nearby, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Kathy, did, uh, Kathy, my colleague, Kathy, or were there any other questions that came up or? I have none at this time, but definitely if people wanted to, for this last part, um, you know, send in your questions. Um, but I will say just being in the gallery, I know a lot of people ask me if Kathy Bates knows about the show. So I find that interesting. That seems to be a very common question amongst mm -hmm. our visitors to the gallery, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, another, another parallel I've noticed between your, your both of your practices is just the, the, the interdisciplinarity of, of your projects. Um, Caroline, for example, were you, I mean, I know you have a, a full visual art practice, of course, but were you, did you create the, the sets? Um, the costumes, all of the design. Yes, I mean, Kretsura uh, Dada uh, was all made in my living room uh, using only friends and uh, zero budget. All the, actually, all the budget the festival, the film festival gave me, I decided to buy champagne and, and luxurious food and, <laughs> and, so, and, and to film it. So I, I had literally no budget to make this. Uh, so it was all based on the generosity of colleagues and, and friends. Um, and, and it was actually, it made, it made this, uh, film, uh, with great energy because we were just there to have a good time to know that it, we're doing something important somehow, but also in a, in a non, uh, formal way, sometimes it feels in the filmmaking practice, you, you, you go through a whole process where you have to write a script, you have to you know, really plan the uh, the production ahead. You have to really um, surround yourself with the team. And in this case, we were just trying to create something very free, just in the way of Dadaism, and and to yeah, to bring people together. So it was a it was really great. I'm so glad I finally got to find out more about the Dada Dadaist aspect. I was always curious about that title. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, creature means creature, so it's uh, it's really about 
creating this, this weird creature that is there to reinvent the world, to revolutionize the world and, and make it a better place in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very striking last sequence um, uh, for those who haven't seen it in the gallery or may not be in, in, in Richmond or uh, in Vancouver. Um, you should definitely check it out online just because it, it, I find the, the, that last sequence is just, just stunning. Yeah, and it's something usually we don't do in cinema to have your actors or your protagonists look directly at camera. But in this case, in this last shot, I wanted all the women to look straight at camera because it's it's women asking to be seen, to be heard, to be present, and uh, which is very different from what we usually see in more anthropo anthropological uh, movies or in the media where you know, women, indigenous people are wanting to stay at the margin of society. They're busy at their, at their task or craft or, you know, it's very negative. And in this case, it's, it's no, we're, we're, an act, we're taking an active role in the society. Mm -hmm. I, I also wanted to ask about the waiter in the, in the video. <laughs> Yeah, the waiter is uh, Stéphane Saint Laurent, who's a, who's a very prominent uh, curator in the Ottawa Gatineau region, originally from Moncton. Uh, he's a very longtime ally to Indigenous struggle, Indigenous artists, Indigenous people, and uh, it felt really cool to have him as the waiter uh, and to flip those, those roles as well. And do you know Alanis Obamso? And I have to ask as a fan. <laughs> Yes, I mean, Alanis Obamsawin has participated in a few projects of mine, and she's always agreed to, you know, uh, pose in front of my camera. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, she's, you know, a source of knowledge and inspiration. And in this film in particular, you can see the multi-generational aspect is very important, but you can see how she's really, you know, presented as the queen passing on her knowledge to the next generation. And and um, yeah, building this kind of revolution. Mm -hmm. um, what else did I want to ask? Um, oh yeah, sorry, I, I had asked about the interdisciplinarity of, of your, your practices. Um, Alisa, I know that you also have a design practice and, and in your past work, you've worked with scents, you've worked with, um, in this work, you're, you've, you added um, a poster component. Um, how, or what is the relationship between video for you or how, how do they feed into each other or when do you use one over the other? Yeah, so... So whatever I sort of make, I usually start with a video uh, when I'm working um, and either I, I, I end there or I'll, I'll build out pieces from the video, from the narrative of the video itself. Um, and so in, in past bodies of work, you know, there might be a subject that two people are talking about and then, and then, or a dream, let's say a character has had, and then I will build a sculpture based on an object that was, that was dreamt by one of the characters. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way that narrative has functioned um, in terms of connecting works and in terms of sort of being prompts and cues for, for the way that I will um, make work. Um, uh, but I also like to um, sort of, yeah, position work in a way that is alive in 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 different manifestations. So I work a lot with scent, and um, so many videos have scent components to them. They emit smell in different ways. Um, many sculptures are scented. Um, uh, Kathy was sort of big enough as as she she needed to be <laughs> there is no scent that I I wanted to create for her um at all <laughs> but um yeah the the but I do I have founded a multidisciplinary um studio that's that's and um I work with um two amazing designers and we worked on that poster together um first I had the that that press image of of Kathy the composite of, of Kathy sort of floating around um that I worked on with um uh worked on for the first time that Kathy showed and then we turned that into a poster um, 
and as a takeaway. And so we, we're, we all, I, you know, I'm starting to run some of my own studio projects through, through the bigger studio and we work with clients as well. So it's sort of a balance between more commercial work and, and our art practices. Um, but it's, it's, it's been great to just sort of have this bigger, bigger machine <laughs> to run it all. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, to, and I learn a lot. I learn a lot from their practices and I learn a lot from clients and, and clients wishes as well. So we, yeah, it's, that's sort of how, how things um, get made these days. Um, but, but in general, yeah, it's, it's really every, every work I've made come originates from, from a video and from the narrative of a video. I can't think of one that that is independent of it. Mm -hmm. I, um, this one felt that um, it really kind of grounded or um, provided sort of a more, I just, I guess, a sort of social and political context to that video, which yeah. without it perhaps could be more of a, maybe sort of a more of a dreamy or slightly surreal experience perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have said it that way, but I fully, fully agree. It, it needed, you know, I, a lot of the time people are sort of cinephiles or fans and they'll come up to me and they'll like say, you know, that clip is from this this film or that clip is from that film. And we have this sort of like nerdy conversation about the source material, but I've never uh, done anything with it um, in sort of an exposed way. You know, I've I've categorized and I've, I've uh, I have my own index system and I have classification systems, um, but I've never really actually brought it to the forefront. But in this case, it was super important to just see the the way that she's been described. You know, in this in this, um, I don't know how to yeah, like you know, is it objective? No, but we we take it for that. You know, people go to IMDb, copy and paste constantly and regurgitate that material as well. Mm -hmm. And so it was really important to to include that um, and to just feel that with with the presence of the video. Um, and in this and and to feel the lexicon as well, to feel the language and and the I, yeah, the sort of like impossibility of, of her identity being anything other than um, mm -hmm. these come this yeah these you know she's not a man she's not a woman she's aggressive she's you know passive she's sexual she's asexual like constant this constant denial of self and erasure of self was happening and you just see that in the language alone so if you all you do is take that poster you would get that as well mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it became important to to include it and I, I yeah this is the first show and thank you for for um supporting that because it it's it, I won't I won't I don't want to show it without it now because it's <laughs> it just feels feels like a good a good um pair mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um well before we end I'd love to just hear a little bit of I don't know what's inspiring inspiring you both right now I always feel it when I often when I speak with artists I don't necessarily hear a, about their influences or what's feeding into their work right now or maybe their next project I don't know if any if you feel comfortable talking about that Caroline <laughs> uh, for me it's a hard question because I feel I'm working on so many different projects uh, simultaneously uh, I'm you know I'm writing uh, my second feature film now uh, which is set in the 70s so I'm really into like 70s uh um, uh, rock and roll drugs sex drugs and rock and roll type of thing that kind of energy but I'm also working on a on a new um, exhibition for September and that's looking more at uh, building and, and construction sites within urban settings so that's also an, another kind of research area I'm, I'm working on so um, I'm just I think right now what is really in intriguing to me is uh uh, this notions of habitat and and everything that we are is kind of dictated by the places we live in and and how we affect our environment uh, and how that environment affects us in return and how it's a constant dialogue between the places we live in the places we move in um, and the people we interact with and I'm really intrigued about all these ideas right now hmm. interesting <laughs> thank you Elisa how about you if you feel comfortable yeah yeah, yeah no it's 
great to be asked. Um, I wrote a script for the first time uh, not long ago, and it's uh, sort of a semi-autobiographical story. Um, takes place in the 80s um, when I was around 12, 13 years old. Um, and it, yeah, it, it now we're casting for it. And the, the main character is going to be what I'm yeah, now calling a doppelganger character. So it will be played by um, five or six, 12 to 15 year old actors. And uh, we'll shoot it in a way where you don't see the actors uh, being multiple. You'll just see this strange, they'll be styled identically. So you, you'll just see the strange change mm. in their um, physicality and their voice, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, that's really exciting. It's it's super daunting, but it, it's very fun. Um, it takes place in, Van in Vancouver, um, in the Dunbar Southlands area um, in, you know, around in that neighborhood. I, I grew up in that neighborhood for a couple of years. And so it's a very, um, yeah, important, important, just important historical piece around just what was happening at the time politically, what was happening colonially, and also just what was happening kind of as a, as a young person. Um, and my friends and my friends at the time in the neighborhood, uh, both on the reserve and out of, and um, sort of in the, more the the area that I grew up in was not only the neighborhood but also I, I spent a lot of time because I went to a very uh religious Jewish school so there's also that element to to the piece so it's it's complex oh and... my gosh that's exciting <laughs> that's exciting news that both of you are working on on films yeah. on yeah. feature yeah. films and uh Elisa that you're bringing that um your your approach to back to a composite characters and mm -hmm. And, and using footage, but then applying that to, to real life actors. I love that. Yeah. I'm curious to see yeah. what that will look like. Yeah. Um, I just got a message from, from uh, my colleague, Kathy, um, the internet, her internet crash. <laughs> so oh. she was, <laughs> so on that note, <laughs> I just wanted to, um, yeah, maybe I'll end, end here, but I just wanted to thank, thank you both for being so generous with your time and, um, just having such, I don't know, it's just such interesting, interesting works. Um, a curator once told me, when you're curating, you should always see, you should think about whether how long you can write about a work. And I feel, <laughs> I feel that both of your works have generated so many different thoughts, or even where I've maybe changed what I think, and even hearing what I what I heard today has maybe adjusted a bit what I think. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you to everyone who attended. Um, uh, there's still time to see the exhibition. It closes on April 2nd. Uh, so I hope we'll see you there at Richmond Art Gallery. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Take you. care. Bye. Thank you.